This TV series explores a variety of issues that relate to peace, social justice, and nonviolent social change. When current events are being discussed in the news media uh, or in comments by politicians or ordinary people, we often hear people speak negatively about other people's religions. News media, politicians, and ordinary people sometimes use some person's extreme actions to make broad stereotypes and accusations about that person's religion. No one person represents the full, authentic view of that religion, and it's just not fair to judge an entire religion by one person's behavior. Actually, even though all people fall short of what we uh, profess to believe, the authentic beliefs and teachings of various religious faiths actually support profound respect for all human beings, profound compassion, and peace. During this hour, we'll explore these truths for four different traditions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and Buddhism. We'll explore how these different traditions move their members to work for peace. And I'm happy to welcome four guests who will make this a very rich and informative and warm hour. They can speak from their own faith perspectives. Danny Cadden comes from the Jewish tradition. He has a doctoral degree in sociology and Jewish studies. He belongs to Olympia's Temple Beth Hatfilo. He also works as executive director of Interfaith Works uh, in Thurston County, which for 40 years has helped people of different faiths uh, connect with each other, understand each other, and work together to serve our community by addressing hunger and homelessness and social justice and other issues. Don Foran comes from the Catholic part of the Christian tradition. He was a Jesuit for 17 years and a priest for four years. He has a doctorate in literature and through decades of college level teaching, he has connected students with philosophy, literature and poetry and profound issues of the real world, including peace and justice. And he's been active for decades in our local communities activities related to faith and peace and justice. Sheikh uh, Yosef Wanli is the new Imam of the Islamic Center of Olympia, and we welcome him to the Olympia community. Uh, he has a previous academic background in health management and policy. He's lived mostly in Oregon and California and has studied Islam very extensively in several other countries. He's also taught Islamic studies in San Jose. Dan Ryan has a background as a school teacher and as an advocate for peace and human rights. He has practiced meditation for more than 30 years and he has practiced the Zen form of Buddhism for several years and has been very active for some time locally in the South Sound Buddhist Peace Fellowship, Veterans for Peace, and the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation. I'm glad all of you are here. We will have a rich conversation and this will be a lot of fun. Thanks for having us. I want to just let the viewers know that we'll start by asking each person in turn to highlight some aspects of his own faith tradition that move people from that faith tradition to work for peace. And then we'll ask each one again in turn for some additional information from that tradition, uh, perhaps from uh, scriptures or other writings or perhaps from the practice itself. Most of this program will be a conversation about various aspects that they may have in common or where they may differ, but also about the value of appreciating and respecting each other's religions and working together across different faiths. So Danny, let's start with you. Could you share us some basic groundings about why Jews work for peace? Well, um, the idea of peace, the concept of peace is a fundamental one in Jewish teaching uh, with, with origins in antiquity. And so these are not just modern expressions uh, of peace uh, as we discuss it today, but rather uh, that has come to us through the millennia. Um, the word itself in Hebrew, the word for peace, shalom, which, which is, I think a lot of people are familiar with, uh, comes from a root word meaning completeness and wholeness and safety. Um, and so there's, there's a, some rich, powerful meaning there. Um, this is an, an idea that spoke to people in ancient times. Uh, trying to seek a better life. And in the tradition, the idea of peace is something that the whole world is trying to achieve. The whole reason for living 
is to, is to work toward peace. And so it is one of the most fundamental principles of Judaism. Mm -hmm. the, the, that shalom concept, it, it really is powerful and people pick up on it though. The wholeness, the unity, the, the we're all in this together and it all has to fit together and work right uh, is, is a rich concept and, and a good basis for public policy. Well, <laughs> it should have modern yeah. meaning, not yeah. just ancient meaning. Right, right. Um, is there, um, you, you, when we were preparing on the telephone for this program, you mentioned something about um, uh, humans interacting and struggling to become better human beings as part of a, a developmental process. Well, in, in Jewish life, um, there's a, a strong commitment to, uh, to living in the here and now, to making uh, our lives succeed, our connections with each other, and uh, I mean, these, these are the teachings um, that come down to us from ancient times that uh, we are striving to a better world. And um, for, for the common people, mm -hmm. not just the learned people, um, this is how we're grappling with survival. Mm -hmm. um, and the concept of peace as not only a dream to try to achieve, but uh, something we can live in our, in our daily lives mm -hmm. um, had resonance then as it, is, as it has to us today. Yeah. Okay, we will revisit some of this uh, later uh, in the program. Thanks. Uh, Don, uh, could you share with us some basic sense of why uh, Christians work for peace? What some of the grounding or basic values or motivations are? Well, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, it's so hard to say what every Christian might be motivated by uh, in terms of peace. Uh, but I, I think a lot of it goes back to Old Testament prophets. It also goes back to John's Gospel uh, when Jesus is said to have said that uh, uh, he came that we might have life and have it more abundantly, uh, that people should lay down their lives for their friends. I mean, those are kind of really uh, touch points for most Christians uh, considering witness as a large part of what they do and ensuring that there's justice for their sisters and brothers uh, in order to achieve peace. It's kind of like mm -hmm. peace flows out of justice, I think, for, uh, for many of us. Uh, you, you mentioned when we were on the phone preparing for this that it's, it's an active thing that people have to do theology and not just know the theology as an abstract. Mm -hmm. I think that after the Second Vatican Council and then uh, into the era of liberation theology, there was m more of an emphasis on uh, doing theology rather than knowing it. And so, because we have to witness to the things that we believe in. I think as a teacher and as a, a Christian, I, I feel witness is so very important and, and what has motivated me in my life has been the witness of people from all traditions who really uh, make a statement with their lives about where their values are. There's a kind of integrity or wholeness to the things they say are important. And, and we'll talk about some of these role models uh, uh, much later in the program, but that's, that's a good uh, uh, teaser for the folks watching to right. stay with us. Um, uh, Sheikh Wanli, uh, uh, can you share with us some of the basic groundings that move Muslims to work for peace, the basic values or teachings or practices? The reality is, when we look around us, the earth consists of so many various colors, so many various colors, so many various creatures, so many various substances. And from these things, in the Islamic point of view, it's a thing that should draw us closer to the recognition of God. What does that mean? We understand in the various religions that God, He did not leave. When I say He, again, it's a linguistic term. God does not consist of a sex. He did not leave mankind to be astray, but He sent messengers to establish His oneness. And these messengers, they consist of signs to prove that indeed, here, listen all, I'm the, I'm, the I'm the letter carrier. 
Moses split the sea. Jesus cleared the blind, the leprosy. Prophet Muhammad fed the poor with water coming out of his hands, for example. But at the same time, we have other signs. And some of those signs is the signs that we see every single day around us. Most fundamental thing. We have a verse in the Qur'an, the religious scripture for the Muslims, which goes as, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافُ أَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَأَلْوَانِكُمْ And from amongst my signs, God Almighty's signs, is the creation of the heavens and the earth, and your differences in color, skin color, appearance, and your differences in language. Verily in that are signs. So when we look at these things, indeed these are signs for us to recognize that indeed Mankind is going to have differences. He is going to have differences. Living up to this, especially in our society today, where the world is interacting so much, it's the age of information, the age of connection, people are going to cross roads. That's why we have a fundamental pillar in the Islamic perspective. And to treat them in perfection and in goodness, others, and be just to them, for verily God Almighty loves the just ones. Thank, thank you. I appreciate the way that you could just pull the, the uh, verses from the Quran from your memory and then give us uh, uh, an, uh, an immediate and rich English uh, translation. Thank so you. thank you, for, thank you for sharing that thank you. knowledge and skill. Thank you. Uh, Dan, uh, uh, let's get a, here a Buddhist approach. And I realize as you have said that you don't speak for all Buddhists. There are so many different varieties, but out of the tradition that you come from, uh, the Zen approach and, and Buddhism as you understand it and, and practice, uh, could you give us some sense of why Buddhists may work for peace, what some of the groundings or motivations may be? Well, a principal belief in all of Buddhism is the principle of oneness, that everything is connected and interconnected and interdependent. There is no separation. There's really only that which is. We don't have an individual self, and because of that, we're connected to every other person on the planet. We're connected to all life. And therefore, if we're connected to every other person, if we hurt another person, we are, in effect, hurting ourselves. And we don't want to do that. And um, We come from a, a standpoint that we want to try and practice equanimity, which is where we can love all humans equally, not just our immediate family and friends, but love all humans with equal respect. And if we can do that, then we don't see any difference between ourselves and any other human being. And that's very important in our, our concept of uh, working for peace. I'm already I'm hearing a lot in common across uh, the, the notion of oneness and, and you know, the we're all in this together kind of sense of things and, and appreciation of the diversity even as we uh, share our common humanity and our, our oneness. So this is fun. I'd like to take uh, another run through the, the sequence here and, and see what else you could share from your faiths scripture, your, the holy writings, or the other supplemental writings that have come along since the scripture uh, was, was created, um, or aspects of the practice or the tradition. Uh, could we take a couple minutes each and, and share something from any of that that moves Jews to work for peace? Yes, uh, I mean, the Jewish scripture and the commentaries, the rabbinic commentaries over the centuries are replete in references to uh, peace and justice. Um, justice, uh, peace is presented uh, alongside uh, as a principle with the idea of compassion and justice. Um, and these things are theme, master themes that run through uh, Jewish teaching. Uh, in daily prayer, um, or weekly prayer that the community engages in, um, the liturgy is, is full of references to peace. It begins and ends prayers um, and supplications, um, and, it, and it defines how we want to live with each other. Um, and I have a couple of examples. Um, 
on the Sabbath, at the end of the service in which the Torah scroll or portion of the Torah scroll is read uh, and it's put back into the ark, um, the following words are expressed in closing that part of the service. And, it, and they're beautiful words in Hebrew and in English. It is a tree of life for those who grasp it, speaking of the Torah, and its supporters are praiseworthy. Its ways are ways of pleasantness and all its paths are peace. Mm -hmm. And this is a, you know, a, a sublimely poetic a uh, statement on a weekly basis as part of the weekly cycle mm -hmm. of worship. Um, also, uh, a quote from the Book of Numbers uh, called the Priestly Blessing, which uh, uh, often is given by rabbis. Uh, may God bless and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his face to you and grant you shalom, grant you peace. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, I, I would... I would want to cite some of the words of Isaiah, the great prophet, mm -hmm. seventh century before the common era, uh, very ancient time. And of course, I think many people are familiar with, with uh, the imagery of, of beating swords into plowshares mm -hmm. and spears into pruning hooks. Mm -hmm. And also uh, a reminder of, of that great vision Isaiah shared of the wolves dwelling with the lambs, the leopards with the kid, the goat, and the, and the calf and lion together. Exact quotes from the scripture. Mm -hmm. And these are visionary uh, words mm -hmm. that have stimulated, you know, people and guided people throughout the generations. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Don, could we uh, get something from you, either from, again, the, the Christian scriptures or subsequent writings or any aspect of the tradition or practice? Well, Danny gave us a very rich uh, assembly of uh, ideas and quotations and uh, Christians share in that Judeo-Christian tradition. Uh, but there are also other stories like the prodigal son, uh, the good Samaritan, those kinds of things that have, uh, have uh, helped to prompt people to do justice in their own lives. Mm -hmm. I, I'm al always mindful of the poetic aspects of things and in the Christian tradition there are a lot of poets like uh, Jared Manley Hopkins who says uh, at the beginning of the wreck of the Deutschland, thou mastering me God, giver of breath and bread, world strand, sway of the sea, Lord of living and dead, thou hast bound veins and bones in me, fastened me flesh, and almost undone what with dread thy doing, and dost thou touch me afresh? There seems to be always in the religious traditions, this possibility of being touched afresh, of, of uh, we all fail, we all are imperfect, and yet we can always uh, be better, we can always uh, reignite our own best selves. And through the example of Jesus, but also many other prophets and abbots and abbesses and teachers, Mm -hmm. Seems to me those are the, it's the sense of family, of, of uh, elders and friends and co-workers, people who we see uh, an ideal in. We're, we're able to follow along because we gain strength from seeing what other people can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Yosef, uh, uh, same, same question for you, either parts from scripture or subsequent writings or from the tradition or uh, the practice. As Muslims, first and foremost, when, when I say a Muslim, I refer to a person who believes, who has submitted him, his will to the oneness of God. Yeah, well, that's the, the, what Islam, the exactly. word means, it's submission. Exactly, thank you very yes. much. Yes. So when we say Islam, just to clarify to the viewers, I am not excluding this nation, do you see, to be its own, but I'm referring to every single nation beforehand that talked about the oneness of God, that a prophet came and talked about that oneness and those followers who followed. In this perspective, the Muslims, they hold so high the names and attributes of God Almighty. And we find when we refer back to the teachings of Islam, the traditions, the, the prophetic teachings of the Prophet Muhammad in the Qur'an, we find, for example, 
that God, he specifies to himself, he negates certain attributes. One of those is oppression. Mm -hmm. We have a verse in the Quran that says, Inna Allah la nasa shay'a, that God Almighty, he does not oppress anybody in the least. What does this mean? How do we understand this? How do we apply this in a human perspective, a created perspective? So we refer to its explanation. So one day our Prophet Muhammad he said, Verily God Almighty has forbidden oppression upon himself, so you people do not oppress. Mm -hmm. We take the greatest teaching, the greatest example, and we apply it upon ourselves. Great. Could you share another example with us along the same line of either something coming out of the scripture or other writings or the tradition or practice? There are so many examples. I know. Yeah, there's so <laughs> many examples. And I also love to hear uh, my, uh, my companions here at the, the table, their perspective on things. But since there's that little extra time, maybe I can add a little bit. We can benefit a little bit to each other. The fact of the matter is many times we find that there are religious teachings in our scripts, in our scriptures. And these teachings, it's not just for the individual self, but it's for their interaction with people throughout their everyday life. For example, we have a verse, أَتَأْمُرُونَ النَّاسَ بِالْبِرْ Do you call people to righteousness and you forget yourselves? Do you not have any comprehension? أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ so for example, the Prophet Muhammad, he said, the best thing a person can be given is good manners. Why good manners? Because the way a person interacts with people, that's how people will have a change to themselves and will have a change to the society around them. We start with ourselves, and from there we build to our family, and from there we build to our community, and from there we mm -hmm. change the world. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Dan, same question for you. Is I know there's so many rich uh, Buddhist you know, scriptures and all kinds of writings since then, uh, plus the, the tradition and the practice. Can you share something else from, from any of that that moves Buddhists to work their peace? Well, I'll say first of all that Buddhism was not meant to be a religion. It was intended to be a psychology for living with the uh, intention of relieving suffering in the individual person and also in the greater world. And you can practice that by uh, following the Four Noble Truths, which also include the Noble Eightfold Path. Within the Eightfold Path is right thinking, right speech, right action. And if you practice these, and that's what I mean by practice, and it's a lifelong practice. I'm still working, mm -hmm. and I'll be working the rest of my life mm -hmm. on getting to the point where I want to be. But by, uh, by practicing, you work on creating peace within yourself. That's why meditation plays such a big part in, in Buddhism, finding that quiet place within you and becoming quiet and peaceful and then taking that peace out into the world and living that peace and being peaceful towards other people. It's perfectly human to experience anger, to feel anger towards someone. But the idea is, not to, is to not act on that anger. And in doing so, we practice nonviolence, which you're familiar with. So there's lots of writing on peace. Thich Nhat Hanh has a lot to offer in that, and I'll talk about him some more later. But he's been a big inspiration to me, both Thich Nhat Hanh and the Dalai Lama. They've written wonderful, wonderful books on peace. Yeah. How The idea is to become peace, to be at peace in peace. There's a lot of letting go in Buddhism, and from what you said just a moment ago about what you do with anger, and it's like letting it go so you don't act on it. And, and there's so much um, of, of a releasing of that and not being tight. That it's just a great, like I say, a, 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 a psychology for living rather than the intention of being a religion like we think of other religions. So it's, it's just a very fresh approach that I appreciate very much. 
when we were preparing for the program, I was on the phone with each of you and asked, you know, what, what kinds of things would you want to talk about? And we had a number of themes that one or several of you mentioned. And I want to lift some of these up now and, and invite us to converse about some of these. Uh, one that, that you had mentioned about this, the sanctity of life is just an overriding principle, you said. And you said it, it, it basically it, it trumps other considerations. Um, and so uh, all of you folks come from traditions uh, where, where you value life and especially have profound respect for human life, but all life really. Could, could we talk about how you see that from your various traditions? Any, any of you in any sequence? I'll go ahead. Yeah, do it. Yeah. So we have one tradition, a prophetic teaching. Because the reality is the human being is not alone on this earth. There are other creatures that are also living upon this earth. Our actions is going to also have an effect on other creatures, the trees, animals, ocean, etc. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he once said, لِكُلِّ كَبْدٍ رَطْبَةٍ أَجْرٍ For every living substance, if you were to provide it with water, it counts as a charity. More teachings. Any plant, that, any seed that you place upon the earth in which it grows, animals feed from it. People use it for shade. The poor people, the wayfarer, the, the traveler comes by just to eat from its fruits. It's a charity. And the reality is, to the viewers, is we're all living here on this earth together. The same way you want to be treated, you treat others in the same way. That great Christian poet, Jared Manley Hopkins, also says, uh, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness, deep down things, very much like Joseph has said. Uh, Joseph has said, uh, and I think that Christian people do see a connection between uh, affirming life wherever it exists. I know Emerson one time said, "Anything that is beautiful in nature is a wayside sacrament. Hmm. You know, a sacrament, a sign of the presence of God." Uh, and, and I really think that maybe that's where our idea of compassion comes from, too, because compassion comes out suffering with other people. When we see someone else hurting, uh, we feel compelled to help them, uh, not for our own sake, but for the sake of the other person who is suffering. And, and I really think these connections, these larger themes, these universal themes, mm -hmm are very much, uh, very much run through uh -huh. all great religions yeah. and uh, all committed peoples. Well, that, that compassion for the other uh, pertains to what you had mentioned a few minutes before, the story of the Good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. And for people who don't know that story from uh, Jesus' teachings, uh, there was a, a fellow who was out walking from one place to another, out way out, and thieves came upon him, beat him up, and took his stuff and threw him in the ditch. And various people came by, including religious leaders mm -hmm. and people of high status, and they all didn't want to deal with it. But the person who stopped and actually helped him was a person from Samaria, which at that time was, was like the, the enemy country. An it outsider, like the outsider. person. Yeah. So it was the outsider that actually provided the compassion and the care and took the fellow to an inn and said, you know, let this fellow stay here, I'll pay for his keep do what it takes to patch him up, heal his wounds, I'll come back and, and pay you. Uh, and so it, the, it was a story not only of compassion, but also of peace, because mm -hmm. it's the outsider, it's the person that we're supposed to think of as the wrong kind of people, mm -hmm. the wrong and, ethnic group, and the gave, wrong nationality. it gave rise to the question, who is my neighbor? Right, and that was the punchline oh, sure. was, was to that story that Jesus taught, was who is my neighbor? And it turns out, my neighbor is and we, anybody who needs it, including somebody from another country or another nationality. Yeah. We struggle well, with that all the time. I, yeah. I think it's because uh, in our heart of hearts, we are all conflicted. We all have self-interests and we all want to do the right thing. Uh, Faulkner says someplace that uh, in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech that uh, the human heart in conflict with itself is the one thing worth writing about. It's because we do recognize that our, our heart yeah. is in conflict. That's why Dan's talking about trying to still the heart, trying to 
have a sense of quiet and meditativeness so that we can little by little do the right thing. I'm struck by our references here are, are going to the individual, they're going to our relations as human being to human being, uh, or those we encounter uh, in close proximity. It seems to be the hitches when you bring it up to the institution level and the mm -hmm. nation level yeah. that things sort of don't work out. <laughs> um, they don't reflect these values, yeah. these deeply felt values throughout the, the, the millennia. And you know, this is the hitch. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think we have our faiths to, to draw on for enormous direction, inspiration. These are divine, divinely inspired uh, qualities. But uh, implementing them on a larger scale True. seems to be yeah. the, the real challenge. Yeah. Thoreau said that uh, wherever there's a lull in truth, an institution springs up, <laughs> and that, that, that may be that may be true. Uh -huh. But but that doesn't mean that uh, institutions aren't reformable if, if yeah. people can yeah. can uh, energize them in yeah. good ways. And a lot of what we do on this program, TV program series, over the months is is try to do that. You know, right. how do we get from our level of values to um, you know uh, change the institutions, whether it's governmental institutions or economic systems or whatever, but that would be another good topic for a, a future TV program sometime. The, the stories, that, the things that we talked about here just a moment ago had to do with compassion, and that was another theme that, that several of you mentioned as being just crucial to uh, your, your own faith's approach to peace, is the sense of compassion. I mean, I, I, I think most of you, maybe all of you, uh, uh, Dan, you had mentioned compassion. I mean, that's just one of the key elements in, in Buddhism. Yes, it is. But it's important to understand the Buddhist concept of compassion. It's not something you give to somebody. It's where you take on the other person's suffering. Mm -hmm. You suffer with them yeah. so that you can come to understand what's behind their suffering, right. which is usually some kind of often fear. Right. So what's mm -hmm. driving that yeah. fear? Yeah, and, and when, when Don mentioned compassion, he gave a little quick translation to what the root word to, means, to, which is To suffer with, with yeah, compassio. So same, mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that you're on the same track there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, in, in the Muslim tradition, there, there's this wonderful listing of all the different attributes of God or the names for God, and one of them is the compassionate one, and I, I love that, to, to think that's that's who God is. God is the compassionate one, as well as all these other, how many? Is it 99 names? Or? Uh, there's more than 99. <laughs> I, I heard one time uh, at, a, at a national FOR gathering a, uh, a good Muslim uh, read through the, the list in both uh, Arabic and English. And it's just the, and, and it was just kind of a silent meditation, <laughs> eyes closed thing. And we just let all these names wash over us. It was just a wonderful experience. That's great. But the compassionate one. Compassionate, very beautiful, very moist, very fruitful. Every time we begin a chapter in the Quran, we recite Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in, in the name of God, the most merciful, the most compassionate. Mm -hmm. God, He established upon Himself mercy, the all merciful, the most merciful, the most compassionate. Mm -hmm. We have a verse, for example, that God, He rose above the heavens after creating the heavens and the earth. And he attributed upon himself something. He said, Ar-Rahman al arsh istawa The most merciful, he rose above the throne in a way that suits his majesty. And this mercy, he actually, the root linguistic term also refers back to the female womb. Mm. Because how much compassion? Mm -hmm. The mother and the connection it has to mm -hmm. the child. Mm -hmm. That's in Judaism too, a general rule that we carry in our pocket, that actually everyone should carry in our pocket, even if it's a Muslim teaching, even if it's an Islamic teaching. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he once said, Irhamu man fil ardi, man fil sama. Have mercy, compassion upon those on earth, the one who is above the heavens will do the same to you. That's a lot like the golden rule, of course. Yeah. yeah, which is also on our list of things to talk about. You, you mentioned when, 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 when he was talking about the, the connection with the, the woman, and you mentioned to Danny that was like the, the, the Hebrew tradition. Is there something you could say about that to add to this common point? Well, these are, I mean, I, 
these allegories, um, I, think, I think the important point here uh, is, is to understand the connection between uh, the divinely inspired thoughts and, and the lived experience of people. So um, when, when we make connections like this, allegorical connections, um, these reinforce um, deep emotions and desires mm -hmm. in, in humans. And uh, I also want to say that uh, rather than people being well-read and studying all the time, which is not the case in, in most cultures and societies, mm -hmm. we, we work and have to labor to, to get by uh, in, in most of the countries of the world and don't have time. And, and in many cases, people aren't even literate. But um, they learn these from the teachers. And they also, these, these ideas are reinforced in the real lives people live and the real lessons they learn and the experiences that they have, the, the tragedies and the good things. And um, I, I think we could spend an entire you know, seminar just talking mm -hmm. about some of these beautiful allegories um, that, uh, that people can then speak to from their own lives. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the golden rule, which you mentioned, is actually the next one on my list that I was hoping we could say something about. Could we just say something briefly about that and then move on? There is a, uh, a story from the Talmud, uh, the Mishnah, the, the compilation of, of uh, commentary um, in the early rabbinic period, where a young student eagerly asks the, the sage, what is the real teaching of, of our faith? And the rabbi you know, probably smiles and says, repeats the golden rule, basically, mm -hmm. uh, and says, now, all the rest is commentary. Mm -hmm. Now go and study. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that, the message there is that that's it, and everything mm -hmm. you know, comes from that. Right. Well, and, and Jesus takes the same point, and he responds when somebody asks him, you know, what, what's the greatest commandment? And he says, you know, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. And he says, you know, that, that's what it boils down to. So, well, he came out of that tradition, so, but he just, uh, you know, if you get a good line, you just use it again. And he had heard this line from when he was young, and he, so when somebody asked him, he had the same good punchline, but, but very profound. Yeah. The uh, theologian Karen Armstrong has a, uh, a project underway to try to identify in all the religions of the world how the, the golden rule plays out how in some way every religion really has at its heart doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's just, it, it's such common sense. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think it's so much a part of all of our religions where we mm -hmm. see people being compassionate, where we see people doing justice, where we see people risking uh, like the, uh, the women in El Salvador who were martyred, uh, Eda Ford and Maura Clark and uh, the lay worker Jean Donovan and so forth, Oscar Romero, people like that. They they were uh, they were trying to do unto others mm -hmm. as they would have done to themselves. Right. They they put themselves in someone else's moccasins for a while, and sometimes when people do that, they get murdered for it. Mm -hmm. If there are uh, powers out there that are uh, really uh, honed against those who would side with the poor, those who would side, side with the marginalized. Right. A, a recurring theme that we've been sharing here has to do with living ethically and acting on your faith. And, and all of you have touched on this in various ways. Um, in the context of our discussion, you know, we have some practical implications then for how we live our daily lives. And I wonder if we could spend the, just a, another moment playing with that. Uh, well, this is a powerful theme in modern Judaism where there is a distance from the old traditions uh, from other parts of the world. The immigrants came to this country and they modernized uh, many of their ways, including their religious practices, adapted to an American scene. That's one of the important uh, stories of modern Judaism. But even the most liberal branches or the most uh, changed branches of Judaism um, retained this, this teaching of ethical living, that Judaism, regardless of your specific faith beliefs and your, your own sense of the existence of God, is still expressed as a, as a profoundly Jewish expression 
in, in ethical ways in the mm -hmm. here and now, in the world we live in today, in our treatment of ourselves, in our treatment mm -hmm. of, of others, and in treatment of, of the world around us. And it is a very powerful motivating feature of, uh, of, of progressive American Judaism. And I do want to make that distinction between uh, tradition and variations mm -hmm. on tradition, because that's a reality in, in how the, the community has developed over the years. Mm -hmm. Other voices? Uh, I, I found that uh, people like Dorothy Day, uh, a, a student of mine, Father Greg Boyle, who's a Jesuit working in East LA with the gangs and started Homeboy Industries. And you know, the, these people really do inspire me a great deal. Uh, my wife Maggie and I came to a conclusion a couple of years ago that it was necessary for us to step away from the traditional uh, Roman Catholic Church that was the church of our uh, youth. And we uh, uh, began to support and work with a, uh, a woman pastor. So Diane Whalen is our uh, Roman Catholic woman priest. And we made this step because we found that kind of a community welcoming to uh, gay and lesbian people. We found it uh, courageous in the face of different kinds of injustices. And, and it's just a small token movement, but I think we have to always try to be attentive and alert to the way the Spirit might be moving us individually mm -hmm. and moving within our churches. Sometimes a little act of resistance like that uh, is the best thing that we can do uh, because we're all just trying to be authentic mm -hmm. within a, a world of yeah. values. There's another example that comes to mind, and I think, Dan, you had mentioned this on the phone when we were preparing for the program where uh, you, you quoted uh, Mohandas Gandhi, the Mahatma, uh, who comes out of a Hindu tradition, uh, uh, saying, be the change that you want to see in the world. So when we talk about ethical living, practical implications for how we live our faith. Um, he says, be the change that you want to see in the world. And, and he was not trying to convert other people to Hinduism, and other people tried to right. convert him to Christianity or whatever. And he's, he said, whatever faith you are, just be that really, really well. Do that authentically and faithfully and thoroughly and, and make the, the most of what your own path is, all that diversity that we have among us. Mm -hmm. And so he was happy staying a Hindu. He found richness in that. And, and um, but his approach to this living stuff was be the change you want to see in the world. He also, his autobiography was the story of my experiments with truth. So he always kept an open mind. <laughs> he was always willing to change and grow and, and challenge himself. So I've, we don't have any Hindus on, in the group here tonight, but I just want to lift that up is right in, in line with uh, things we've been saying, including the, the unity of everybody and so forth. May I add a, a point, please? Yes, please. In the individual lifestyle that we've been talking about, undoubtedly the human being, he has, he has desires or she has desires. People have desires and they'd like to quench those desires. One of those greatest desires is just to make it in the life, right? To become rich. Everyone wants to become a millionaire, mm -hmm. right? Everyone wants to do that. Every child wants to go to the MBA, right? Those athletic children. <laughs> the reality is we have a tradition that if mm -hmm. the human being had two valleys, a valley of wealth, of gold, they will strive, they will want another one. So that <laughs> desire is not going to be quenched. <laughs> That's the reality. Yeah. We get the Mercedes two years ago, we want, two years later we want the Lamborghini. Yeah. That's what happens, <laughs> yeah. right? And someone gets the new, new Nintendo for those youth that are watching this, now, <laughs> this, this uh, program. So the reality is, what's richness? How do we, what's ethical living in our everyday life? Mm -hmm. We have a teaching, the Islamic perspective, that richness is ghina nafs. Richness is self-contentment. Mm -hmm. That's why you find the mother mm -hmm. cat with her daughter cat, and that's the best thing in the world to her. Mm -hmm. I'd like to add <clears throat> that if you're looking for satisfaction in the outer world, fulfillment, you're not going to find it. That's basic to a lot of faith traditions and, and in Buddhism we work to go inward and to that, that's the whole mm -hmm. basis behind meditation is looking for that peace, satisfaction inside you. 
mm -hmm. and to live an ethical life, a, a life that's honest and authentic, the word you used, mm -hmm. but also, first of all, authentic to yourself. Be honest to yourself, and then you can be honest to others, mm -hmm. and to practice compassion, loving kindness, and service. And when you do that, you're giving to others rather than simply to yourself. Right. So you, you find that giving to others is more important than getting that Mercedes or whatever. It's also the oneness that we've talked about a couple times in the program mm -hmm. because in the mm -hmm. Buddhist approach, uh, the, there's a, a strong principle of non-duality. And you talked about this early in the program, that, that it's all one. There's not like an us versus them. We're all us. And, and if, if inside we're, we're one, then we don't have like that empty, vacant part of me that can be satisfied by owning a, uh, an expensive new car or whatever, spiffy, whatever. But there's a, a, some integrity, oneness, um, that relates to that experience that you're talking about. Yes, and I don't want to gain for myself at the expense of someone else. Right, right, right. Um, <clears throat> you, we mentioned uh, a couple of role models. You mentioned uh, Dorothy Day, and you mentioned Thich Nhat Hanh, and, and you mentioned some others. Um, uh, we, we've got um, Abraham Heschel, who had done wonderful work with Martin Luther King and, and other areas of social justice. And there, there are so many role models, and we talked about that a little bit, but I want to just lift that up briefly and then move on. Are there other role models that we want to talk about who give us some... Uh, inspiration or direction? Well, I think Martin Luther King Jr. was almost a quintessential uh, prophet in the modern era uh, because he was able to suggest that there's a cycle of violence and violence begets violence. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I have this wonderful uh, photograph in my office and uh, Gandhi is in the picture, and Martin Luther King is standing there under him. Gandhi was uh, an influence on King, and, mm -hmm. and Thoreau was an influence on Gandhi, right. which was interesting. Uh, and there is this kind of idea, but, but King says that darkness does not drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Mm -hmm. And hatred does not drive out hatred. Only love can do that. <laughs> You know, to me, he internalized the religious Judeo-Christian messages that he, he was really raised on yeah. scripture. And he, he was able to articulate it in a way and then apply it to people who were being oppressed, whether they were garbage workers in Memphis or, or wherever he saw it. And it wasn't just about uh, racial issues. It was right. about economic Economics issues. And, and basic human dignity. He, you know, he, the, People refer to him as Dr. Martin Luther King, and he earned his doctorate. He was an actual PhD scholar in philosophy with a, with a degree. And there's a book I have, a very thick book, that traces his theological development from the academic work that he had done. He didn't write it, somebody wrote it about him, but they traced the different theologians, and here's what he got from this person. Here's what he got. And as I read through this, I go, wow, I, uh, there's, I, I know the speech where this line emerges again and oh I know how this line or this approach from this other theologian appears it's just a fascinating thing but he, he yeah he really had a rich uh, mind for philosophy and just a, a rich depth of faith and was able to put together all kinds of stuff from all kinds of philosophers and theologians and everybody and he made it work <laughs> and then he lived it in very practical ways uh, yeah he was great well, let me turn your question on its side a little bit. Sure. And, and there's, a, there's a tradition in Judaism uh, that was articulated uh, by, the, uh, by Maimonides, who was, uh, had a rich uh, role in, in um, Jewish philosophy uh, during the early medieval period, but in North Africa, in Egypt, uh, and the encounter with Islam at that time. And one of his teachings was that the highest form of Tzedakah, that is a Hebrew word based on the word for justice, which is, uh, it's not right to translate it as charity, but, but that, that caring and giving to others mm -hmm. as an obligation, is to do it anonymously. Yes. Huh. And, and so role models are powerful, and they're part of our makeup, 
in, in a society. But that unknown person that we know is out there doing good things mm -hmm. is just as inspiring. And uh, the reason I'm raising this is because just the other day we had a wonderful annual meeting of Interfaith Works, mm -hmm. where I work, and uh, several of the congregations nominated hidden gems. And um, I sat back and watched those, those awards being given and the words being said about these people who are not seeking attention, mm -hmm. uh, but doing good works mm -hmm. and making change. And mm -hmm. that was pretty inspiring. So yeah. I think that it's good to keep in mind, even as we mm -hmm. celebrate these wonderful, right. strong personalities and leaders, that we don't forget the, yeah. the yeah. hidden ones. We're getting that, to that in the culture with this idea of playing it forward, too, you know, that uh, people uh, oftentimes do gratuitous goodness and uh, something that we can all be and called not to. Not for thanks, not for attention. Yes. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to move us into talking a bit about interfaith works and, and the, the whole notion of people of different faiths collaborating. And I know within our local community in, in the greater Olympia area, we have the uh, uh, Olympia Jewish Muslim Listening Group that has done really good work both on, on just a regular basis and sometimes when something has happened and people need to get together and talk, we have a way for, for the people from those two faiths to, to connect. And um, I know the Interfaith Works of Thurston County, I, I've been a supporter of since the 70s. Um, and in, it goes back to when it was Associated Ministries, which started in 1973. And I very much appreciate how Associated Ministries and then since 2004, the new name Interfaith Works um, is not just a Christian council of churches like some communities have, where Christians talk to each other and anybody else is sort of like on the outside or the fringe. But this is richly interfaith. We have Muslim, the Muslim community, and Buddhists, and Quakers, and Unitarians, and all, I mean, all kinds of folks, Baha'is, and mm -hmm. I don't want to leave anybody out, but you've got a lot of yeah. members. Yes. And, and is rich and people get together and they do things together. So they appreciate, they understand each other, they get experience working together on issues of homelessness and hunger. You, you know, you organize the crop walk, you've got the new sidewalk advocacy shelter uh, service for uh, homeless folks. And it's people of different faiths actually doing practical things together. And also you do things where you get together and celebrate the Thanksgiving service annually. and. The Buddhists take the lead on the on the peace walk around Capitol Lake. Mm -hmm. That people of other faiths participate. It's just a great model for other communities to do in a in a way that's inclusive and warm and and integral. I mean, it's all one. It's all connected. The but, name says it all. Interfaith works. Yes. Yeah. I love the pun too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so you you you've been the executive director now for a few years. A couple of years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's well, good. I appreciate your description. I think it was apt, and, and I can't top it. Uh, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let your words uh, suffice. Uh, but I think for the purposes of our discussion here, um, we are sitting here exploring common themes and uh, distinctive features of our faith traditions. And we're doing it with curiosity and interest and openness and respect. And the problem is that so many in our society don't practice those approaches mm -hmm. and or don't know how to practice them. Mm -hmm. And so by having an organization active locally in modeling how to do that, and not just talking, but then doing, mm -hmm. rolling up our sleeves and doing some work, finding uh, different skills mm -hmm. being applied to different social issues and problems, um, we are in fact a, a leading uh, voice for diversity and peacemaking in the community in addition to all the very specific programs yeah. and projects we do. And that's what I'm so excited about. And, and I guess your show here today is, is just yeah. you know, one more aspect right, of that. Right. Well, and justice comes out of many of these things like your uh, rapid rehousing program, the sidewalk programs through Interfaith Works. Uh, so I mean, it's, it's way, ways of doing justice right. and through an institutional base. It's kind of uh, yeah. Challenging to other institutions, right. I think, to see it work this way in community. So I want to put in a plug for the phone number and the, the website. It's 360-357-7224. Uh, and the website is www.interfaith-works.org. Right, so a great, a great place to connect with. If I may add, Greg. Please. One thing, um, what's a very beautiful thing, especially about this, this panel and thanks to the workers in the back, is that 
there are a lot of similarities from each and every one of us in our everyday lives. But at the same time, there are certain theological things in the various traditions that, for example, I can't accept. Mm -hmm. But is that a means to increase animosity towards one another? Is it? The answer mm -hmm. is no. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. For example, in history, you will find, for example, when various nations supported each other to help that oppressed side, to enable success in the society. For example, some Muslims may have entered into a palace and those traditional practices in that palace to the king is that people may bow to the king in history. Mm -hmm. The Muslims, they didn't bow mm -hmm. because in our perspective, we only bow to the creator. Mm -hmm. But was that a means to cause so much hatred to one another, do you see? Mm -hmm. So that's something we really need to realize because especially in the United States, we're just a cooking pot. Mm -hmm. We're just a whole <laughs> bunch of vegetables uh -huh. and one pot. Uh -huh. So how is it that we're going to be able to make this food prepared yeah. for us to eat, yeah. to build that society? Yeah. That's a good point. That, that's, that's true. And, and one of the things, in fact, this is the next point on the agenda because we're rapidly running out of time. But I just wanted to mention that, that the conversation we're having is not to say, let's boil ourselves down to some blandness that's a, a least common denominator. We have a lot in common, but we each have our own authenticity and respect for one's own particular faith and practice and, mm -hmm. and path, and that's fine. And, and it's not like in the sake of cooperation, we have to beat each other down into something that's um, uh, bland. So, well, anyway, I, I, I want to echo that because yeah, I've, we're, had we're very tight on time. I've had conversations with people in, my, in our yeah. interfaith community where they are worried that they're bigots because they don't agree with another teaching yeah. from another yeah. faith. And we have to stop yeah, you know, we, and say, yeah, no. We don't have to agree. Yeah. But, but we, yeah, we have to, it's, it's mutual respect and right. appreciation. It's like what you said at the beginning about the yeah. diversity, all the different colors yeah. and this and that and whatever. That's fine. So anyhow, we're, we're out of time. I want to thank mm -hmm. all the folks who have been participating here. Uh, let people know that through the National Fellowship of Reconciliation, people connect, can connect with the Religious Peace Fellowships for a number of traditions, the Lutheran Peace Fellowship, the Episcopal Peace Fellowship, the Muslim Peace Fellowship, Jewish Peace Fellowship, Buddhist Peace Fellowship, and so forth. And there are a lot of other groups as well that work on peace and human rights from uh, a faith basis. And so I want to thank all the folks who've been watching uh, we, the religion deals with people's deepest beliefs and insights about what it means to be here on earth. And we can connect and realize that we really are one, one human family. Uh, we're all one human family. We share one planet. We can create a better world, but we all have to work at it. And the world needs what you have to offer. Thanks. <laughs>